thanks uh, for joining us on this day. Uh, we're going to highlight quite a few things in this. We've got about under 35, 40 minutes to go over um, our special guest, Greg Bateman, and then and, and Vicky Barnes. Um, we're going to add some professional context to you know the journey that I suppose humans all go on, uh, and we've been on as well. So we're going to highlight some of the um, the instances, trials, and tribulations along the way, and get some professional input. So it's going to be a great discussion. So, Greg, perhaps if we start with you, um, could you give us a brief resume of uh, of who you are, <laughs> who you are, what you're about? <laughs> yeah, I'll keep, it, I'll keep it brief. Um, so, by day, I'm I'm a rugby player, um, club to be confirmed, and uh, by night, I suppose. I'm a business consultant. Um, I have my own beer brand, People's Captain, and um, you know, ticking along. I think a lot of people would love their own beer brand. Is that as good as it sounds? Well, I mean, I have to say it's great. Yeah, but no, it's uh, it is good. It's good fun. It's great fun. Good. And you've been in business. Well. I mean, I, I read somewhere that you were in business from an early age. Is that right? Uh, well, if selling, if selling your mum's cakes at, at school counts as business, then I suppose probably, yeah. No, I, um, I've always just been pretty, pretty kind of, I don't know if entrepreneurial is the word. I've always sort of spotted some opportunities and had a go um, had a service accommodation business here in Leicester, which, which went well while it was, while it was around. Um, and, and plenty of things that I've, I've dabbled in and had a go at, but, you know, to be honest, it's, it's all in line with kind of my values and uh, I just kind of have a go at stuff and, and, and there's been plenty of stuff that, that hasn't stuck to the wall, but you know, some stuff is and, and that's just the way life goes, isn't it? Well, they say mix your passion and your purpose. Well, um, you know, beer, beer is a passion of yours, it is of mine. Um, I'm gonna find a way to try and get that into my uh, professional resume at some point. Yeah. Any, any particular beer, is it? Uh, we we make a few, so um, American Pales, IPAs, Milk Stouts, Tropical IPAs, Lagers. Um, there'll be some pretty funky, crazy stuff coming out soon, but we're, we're just about to go through a big brand and relaunch September, October time, so look out for it. Well, good luck with that, and Brewdog will be looking over their shoulder, I'm sure. I mean, whatever Ooh. happened to them, hey, yeah, who are Brewdog? Where are they, Billion Pound Company? And Dr. Vicky Barnes, um, we know each other well. Um, you've been on the, the Weller Tea interview in the past. You've got a heck of a back catalogue in terms of career and perhaps you could remind us. Hello, it's lovely to be here again. Yes, I've had the pleasure of chatting with you before, of course. So it's nice to be back and nice to meet you, Greg. Um, so in terms of my background, well, I'm a clinical psychologist by profession and my specialism is positive psychology and happiness, which sounds very grand and wonderful, but we know that being human isn't always that grand and wonderful. So it's all about the whole spectrum of mental well-being and everything that we as mortal beings go through and understanding that and, you know, um, accepting and respecting that and talking more about that. So in terms of a very brief background from me as well, which doesn't involve beer, sadly. <laughs> I know nothing about any of that that you just said, but it sounds impressive. I have worked in the NHS for over 10 years as a clinician. So as you'd expect a psychologist to be doing things like, you know, patient facing work, helping people with mental health difficulties. And um, then I worked for the Virgin Group for four years and I went from kind of patient facing to staff wellbeing projects so I was leading and designing national wellbeing um, programs and embedding kind of positive psychology into the strategy and trying to help the workforce to feel good about what they do so that they could help their customers uh, more effectively and within that time I had a really great opportunity of going over to the British Virgin Islands following Hurricane Irma which was devastating to much of the Caribbean and parts of America and speaking to some superbly resilient people out there about their experiences and I was learning as much from them as they were from me I think if not more so so I definitely benefited from that and it was a fantastic experience um, as well and then uh, last year so not too long ago I founded uh, my own business which is called Positive Wellbeing and that means I get to work with people I want to work with like your good selves and hopefully make some positive changes in people's lives and fly the flag for mental well-being and make this a, a global change that we need to kind of accept people a bit more as they are. 
Yeah, that's lovely. It looks like you're both very humble. We've got a, a professional sportsman at the top of his game, and I know that you were in, how many people you had you were looking after um, at the Virgin Group. I, I mean, it was it ran into thousands, didn't it? And um, and you have been to Necker Island. That's what everyone wants to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did. I did. Very fortunate to do that. <laughs> um, you talk about resilience, and this question goes goes to both of you. Um, resilience is something that everyone is showing through COVID, and I suppose everyone has to show to a degree. We're in trying times, and resilience comes from maybe adverse circumstances or things that affect us. It doesn't have to be one big thing necessarily, does it? Perhaps, Greg, if I go to you, have there ever been a time where there's been a series of smaller events which you thought, well, individually, I could handle any of these on my own. Um, and perhaps they, they come a bit like a, a big wave. They come all at you o o at once and you do wonder what is going on here and how can I deal with it? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, they say that the three most stressful things are changing job, moving house and getting divorced. And I seem to do all of those three things fairly regularly. So, um, except for getting divorced, I don't plan on doing that once. But um, the... You know, I think the the life of a professional sportsman is like a constant state of limbo. You know, we, we're on a kind of fixed term contract, and when that finishes, if you if you don't stay there, you're going to be going on to somewhere else. And you know that it's a very sort of transient lifestyle, I suppose, is is the point. But I think what I would say um, resilience means to me is that kind of capacity or space to be able to to deal with what gets thrown at you so uh, as opposed to trying to avoid challenges or or tribulations that come your way it's about having really good strategies in place to be able to overcome them uh, I, I shared an article recently just about um time management but link not just daily and weekly time management but linking it to why you're doing what you're doing because if you for me i believe that if i really believe in what i'm doing then it's going to make the path a lot easier to get down because i know there's a reason why i'm doing it so if it feels a little bit that you know the ground's getting a little bit heavy i know it's for a purpose and it's a lot easier to get there but then i think kind of back on the the flip side of that and i was just interested in listening to vicky there this is the first time we've spoken it's all been kind of email stuff before is uh we need to start talking about mental health differently um i'm an advisory member on a on a board for an app called fika who are like emotional fitness they, they have an app to actually develop this stuff with us develop our self-confidence develop um all, all these kind of skills that we don't practice like we do go to the gym or what we eat or whatever and what i really like about what vicky's saying is we we need to sort of talk about the positive of mental health and what we can gain as opposed to when it gets bad and when it gets rough and it's all what and i'm very happy to to share my story and i know you are as well and and, and it's great because it opens the conversation and people will talk about it more and then people don't feel alone but there's this kind of whole other narrative alongside it that is well, what next like yeah now i know that i'm depressed or now i know that i have anxiety issues but it's like fucking great tell me what i'm gonna do about it like we we need to change the conversation we need a, we need a, we need a positive psychologist where are we going to find one of those from as well that um, Dr. Vicky Barnes, <laughs> um, talk to us about the language around mental health, whether it needs uh, redeveloping, changing, um, and, and turning a, I suppose, a, a negative, although it doesn't, when you're in it, it doesn't feel like it's a negative or positive, you just swamp in it, whatever it is. Talk to us about the positivity around the language we use with mental health. Well, I think the way things stand at the moment, it's, we've got this kind of historical societal view of mental health being a negative thing so if you google physical health and you google mental health when you google physical health you'll get all of these images about you know strength and power and achievement and somebody standing at the top of a mountain or whatever it might be and you google mental health and you get 
you know, dark colors and people with their heads in their hands and lightning bolts to the brain and all of this negative stuff. But mental health and physical health, they're both parts of our health system. So they both should be as positive as the other, right? So the only word that's different is that we swap physical for mental, but for some reason, mental health has this negative connotation. And that obviously comes from years, decades, centuries of the way that we've treated people with mental health difficulties, which has been institutionalize them, um, you know, get rid of them, stay away from them, avoid them, not try to understand, not let them allow them into positions of authority or even jobs at all and, and so on and so forth. So we're breaking through this ha habitual mindset. So what, what the first step is to really start, like we're doing, talking honestly and openly about it, which is amazing. The fact that I'm with two wonderful gentlemen on this call is wonderful because, you know, chaps, we know they don't tend to talk so much about feelings. And again, it's not good or bad. It's just something that, that we know, um, perhaps because of acceptance in society, perhaps, you know, having a, having a professional rugby player on here talking about mental health is just so exciting to me because it's an inspiration to people, I think. And what's going to happen, I'm sure, after this is lots of people will think, right, if Greg's open to this, then I can talk about it too. And that's what I, I'd hope for. But I think that, you know, what language do we use around mental health? Yeah, there's lots of negativity around words like crazy, insane, um, loopy, all of the, these things that we, that we use. But I don't know whether it's so much that we need to be careful about language always, of course. But I think that we need to just really accept that there's a spectrum of mental health that we are all on. So this isn't just that you can call somebody else insane and then that's them and I'm in this other little box which is completely sane. We are all on this spectrum of mental health and I, this is how I want people to see it. Just as we all have a physical body and we need to look after that physical body by you know, good diet, nutrition, exercise, sleep and all of that. We all have a mind as well. There's no getting away from the fact that any one of us could have problems within our mind at any time and sometimes it comes out the blue. So we have to look after that mind just the way we have to look after that body otherwise either one of those things could have a little dip and I'm not saying that all of us will have a mental health diagnosis because the research states it's one in four and I'd always argue actually it's more than that because of stigma and people don't report things and other reasons. I think it's one in one, you know, we will all have a mental health dip at some point in our lives. And that might just be that you're feeling a bit gloomy one day, or you're feeling stressed for a month because things are too intense at work or a relationship breakdown. I mean, we all go through, most of us go through that at some point and it's, it's, it can be awful. So, and these are times when we don't feel as mentally agile or as mentally alert or or as happy as we might be the rest of the time and that's a mental health dip right doesn't mean doesn't mean you're crazy doesn't mean you're insane none of those things are a useful terminology so the language is useless in my mind but what we do need to do is talk positively about mental health being something that we all have it's completely normal it's absolutely fine that we talk about it it's fine that we're up here one day and down here the next we just need to as Greg's just rightly said what do we do about it is the most important thing. Thank you Vicky and I know that even the word mental used to be thrown around my playground as, um, as an insult so now we've got it in the very diagnosis of what you're meant to be putting your hand up to say you've got. Now putting your hand up to say you've got something at the best of times is not terrific. How is it when you're in a big foot changing room Greg and you've got you've got <laughs> eight footers around you and you've got this this image that you've got it, I suppose, you know, this game face that you've got. How easy is it? Has it changed um, in, in the dressing room, so to speak, is it changing in professional sport? Um, I think one of the best things about rugby is how diverse it is anyway. Um, you have a plethora of people from different countries different social background well although we do need we do have some work to do on the social background side of rugby union i think it is still a little bit public school um but that's probably a conversation for another time um but the diversity means that it's probably easier to to talk about this stuff however um that's me saying that and and i've i'm probably quite um open with with how I feel on the inside personality testing I'm a yellow so 
or yellow red so i'm like people first goals second some you know would probably be first to be cracking the jokes first to be taking the piss out of people so i think it was more people noticed that stuff was up with me um, and to be honest most of my mates kind of knew what was going on anyway so were aware of stuff um, and then the judge just sort of slowly started telling a few what was going on and then I started to get some help and like I was really struggling and stuff and they were all just really good um, and it, it kind of it was never a big sort of stand up in front of the boys like look lads I'm depressed and got anxiety issues on, on medication and seeing someone it was just kind of a yeah like that's 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 what he's going for at the minute and the boys are really supportive so um i think it was probably a much bigger deal for me than it was for everybody else if that makes sense um i the the probably the bit that was the tricky bit was about the point of taking medication because that kind of felt like a bit of a i can't handle it situation and I think uh, it'd be really interesting to see what Vicky's experience from talking to her, um, do you call them clients or what do you call them? Yeah, client. Client, yeah. They're not a customer, are they? They're a client. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I remember talking to, to my psychologist about it and just being like, well, what, you know, I should be able to deal with this by myself. Plenty of people do. And um, it sort of felt a little bit like I'd lost um, and being a, yellow red like I'm competitive um so I wanted to to do it all by myself and it's actually only when I had a chat with, with a real good mate of mine he said well, mate when you have like a bad knee or whatever they give you anti inflams and you don't think about it twice you just you take them because it's going to get your knee better but for some reason exactly like uh, Vicky was saying before for our mental health we're suddenly we have this massive stigma and we feel like it's this this huge issue now the first batch of medication that I took um I wasn't the best on um it definitely did the job it got me to sleep and you know helped with a lot of that stuff but um side effects wise like it was a bit of a battle to uh, function effectively on it um but the, the the new stuff I've been on has been been fantastic since so yeah no I'll it's interesting that. the words you interesting the words you use I mean yeah the, the rugby players I suppose you've got each other's back at the darkest the times when you're on the field that you're under pressure so it'd be nice to see if that, that transcends into the change room as well. You used a word which actually I think should be banished, which is should. You know, I should be doing this. You know, you're in a critic when it's really loud. You should be doing that. You should be out running. You should be working harder. You should be doing, oh, for God's sake, give me a break. Greg, at your lowest, um, so that people can relate, and I'm really happy to start this off with uh, to, to show you my authenticity um, in terms of how low it was. I felt like I was, when you're an overachiever and you go through this, I didn't know what was happening to me. Felt like a train had come in from the side i felt like i wanted to achieve which made my anxiety worse because i couldn't so it's that frustration of not being able to do it and it felt like i was on the floor with a foot on my chest wanting to do something but i just couldn't muster up the energy to do it how 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 bad did it get for you what were the symptoms so that others can relate to it and then with that um vicky could you feel free to chip in with whatever advice you could give and I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes of someone watching this now listening to greg and with your sort of professional hat on. Okay, so I mean it's a while ago now. So um I, I think probably the out and out symptoms for me were loss of appetite, which is uh yeah, pretty obvious when that that's down for me. Like normally that's not an issue. Um sleep was huge. Uh, I do still continue to battle with sleep now. I mean I've been through a fairly stressful period uh which has been well documented in the press at the moment. Um, but just couldn't get to sleep or I often end up with like dreaming about the kids dying or, or something that was incredibly intense um, and just incredibly low moods and, and dark thoughts and a real sense of lack of um, purpose for what I was trying to do, which well, obviously I was just trying to play rugby and get my head down. But while this whole thing was going on and it, it sparked off from, from a divorce I suppose but you know with the, the kids being moved away and whatever that was the real kind of difficult um bit going on I think you know Vicky will tell you tell you more about it but what I was was told was it was a kind of grief and loss thing that was being experienced um but at the time I just remember just being so 
angry about the whole thing. Just it was just take, I was probably more annoyed with myself that I couldn't handle it than I was actually annoyed about what was happening because you could see it coming a mile off. Like it, it wasn't, you know, from a relationship point of view, you know, that's obviously very personal, but that wasn't unexpected. But um, it was more the frustration with myself that I couldn't just crack on and, and do what I wanted to, to do. Vicky, I mean, what, why, what is this impending doom? You know, you get one event, you think you can, or you maybe get two or three outside of your control. What, what happens to us, I suppose, physiologically when, this, when that happens? Well, physiologically, what's happening is you're, uh, without getting too technical, because you know I can get my geek on massively about the, the brain. <laughs> I can take up the whole of the rest of the time, but I won't. For another time, maybe. But we've got our sympathetic nervous systems kicking in, and that's the fight-flight response you've all heard of, and um, cortisol, adrenaline's flying around our system more than it should be. So this is all the good stuff that um, makes us realise when there's a threat in our environment, and we need to respond to that threat by preserving our life in some way so flee or fight fight or flight but what happens is when we go through life events our brains our physiology and our neuropsychology they they can't tell the difference between an actual threat to our life and something that's just really really stressful so all of that stuff happens as if we're trying to save our own lives but when we're going through a prolonged stressful period or as you said a few things happen one after the other this stress response is, becomes chronic and our bodies aren't designed to keep it there. And if we're not releasing it in any way, so if, taking the example you've both used, you know, becoming depressed perhaps, and we become more withdrawn, we might not exercise or socialize as much as we would normally. And then there, there's not the same outlet for that stress. So we kind of have a double whammy of all of this stuff that's happening to us physiologically. And that can be really hard then to, what I'm really hearing is something that's so common. And I just want to point that out that, there's those feelings of why can't I handle this I'm, I'm getting angry with yourself and you call it the inner critic and it's also what we call a thinking trap so that word should and I should be able to handle this and what's wrong with me and and then you start to really get it yourself and you attack yourself and then there's another cycle on top of everything else that you've got already going on so um, it kind of becomes this mountain that you're you're sitting under but I think if, if I may just talk about the the dark thoughts side of things and just on that because I think that's something that people particularly struggle with and um, I'm just gonna come right out there and, and say that I think that when people are having those really really dark moments and suicidal thoughts perhaps I know you haven't said that but I'm saying that's kind of in the extreme case obviously people do take their own lives and um it's incredibly sad but at the same time I think we need to start talking about that a bit more so that we're not stigmatizing this thing that happens um, language wise going back to what you said stop calling it committing suicide because we're not committing an offense it's not illegal anymore it used to be I think that's why it's called uh, committing suicide but to take your own life is a choice that people make when they feel there's no other way out and I think what we need to do to start helping people is to first of all realize how common it is actually I think that research shows about 17% of people will have those thoughts it's, it's quite a lot of people actually um, and also there's just something real about I think the most effective thing that can be done when somebody is expressing those kinds of thoughts is somebody just empathizing and sitting with with that person saying yeah I get it life's really hard sometimes and I get that sometimes it'd just be easier to say I want off now I want to get off this bus I want out I don't know what else to do and I'm kind of tired of it and that is okay to feel like to feel like that and to express that is okay I was just gonna sorry to if I've interrupted your flow there but I definitely um agree with what you said and um, to clarify um I think from a dark thought point of view, for me, it was, I almost probably scared myself. So I, I never was like, I'm gonna kill myself. It was more like, oh, what's like, I should, well, I just might as well not be here. And it was then, then it's kind of like, oh, that's actually quite serious. Do, do you know what I mean? But I was just gonna make the point that when you said there about sitting with someone and just talking about it, one of the things I found really frustrating was if I would talk to my mates or, or my, um, now partner about it I would find it so frustrating when people would try and fix it for me because if it was that 
fucking easy. Like I would fix it. Or if I could think about it differently, I would. But when, for so it's almost the sort of support for those who are supporting that's crucial because to just listen. And I mean, you'll know that like, with my, I was always amazed coming out of the, um, so with the psychologist, they never tell you anything. All they do is just listen to you and ask you questions. You do all the work, but I'm paying them to fix all my problems. <laughs> I'm really joking. But tell it, people that. <laughs> yeah, it's genius. It's the best business in the world. Just hold a mirror up. Um, but anyway, the, the point being that that's where the, the sort of creative thinking and thinking about stuff differently comes out because you're here. I started to hear myself saying where I was going with it and then I would, you know, correct myself or whatever. So probably the advice to those supporting people that are struggling is to try and not fix it or to come up with any solutions for them, but to just simply as you said, listen and just be present, which is tough because you, you know, when you, you love someone or you care about someone, you just want to fix it all and you just want to give them a quick, quick roadmap to get better. But it is just about almost that getting it off your chest, isn't it? And can you remember the, um, the, the point where you're at your lowest when, I mean, I'm not just remember it. I mean, can you sense that feeling? And, um, my, my next question is, which is one that, um, Vicky, come in on this, which is, I go on well-being as the direction you're traveling, either up, doesn't matter whether you're at the bottom, but you're coming up, that, that's good. But whether you're going down, that, that the red flags come out, you've got to be very careful. Can you remember the pivotal point, the turning point where you started to come out of this? And, and Vicky, how, how do you stop being depressed? So Greg, we'll start with, with yours, and then I'm going to ask the impossible question to Vicky. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you could let us know, Vicky, that would be great. Um, <laughs> just a short paragraph. Uh, well, I think, you know, I, I was with with all of those sort of symptoms or issues I was facing, I was effectively self-medicating. So I had a very nice wine collection and um, I had a equally nice um, at the time collection of uh, of opioids that I was using to just get myself to sleep. Um, and I was even, I was talking to the psychologist about it, like, I don't care. I have to get to sleep. Also, the the drink was getting me away from it. It was just giving me a bit of a break from, from everything. Unfortunately, when uh, when you stop drinking and when the, the drugs wear off, it all comes back, but normally with a stinking hangover at the same time. So um, I think the point where I suddenly realized a sort of upward trend was when I, th that kind of self-management system w didn't seem to be as necessary. And, and that's a really woolly answer, but that was probably... The, the moment where I was like, actually, I don't need to be nailing a few bottles of wine every night or, you know, all the beers or, or whatever. Um, so I think that was probably it. And, it. and it kind of coincided with starting taking medication because the, the, the one I started on was particularly potent with drink. And the, and the guy was like, it kind of doubles your effect. So that sort of warmed me off I suppose but that was probably the moment when I realized I I didn't have to start managing with my own strategies I suppose yeah anxiety I, I related to being a bully and the bully will go go on have a drink go on have a drink and then it'll lure you into a false sense of security and come and bash you in the face the next morning when you when you have all that self-loathing anyway let alone everything else on top of it so Vicky, when, when someone's getting depressed, I, how can they how can they get out of it? Go on, answer it for all of us men out here wondering, you know, uh, you know, in our time, how do you get out of it? And what's the best thing? Like, Greg just raised a massive point. It affects the people around everyone as well, us and everyone. What, what's the best advice for them and the person at that low time? You could have warned me you were going to ask such an intense question. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> She's got 10 minutes, mate. She's got to get back in. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, is that the time? <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, it's going to be a... There's, 
you know this that there's no there's no quick fix once you're if you're in kind of the depths of depression there's something that's got to happen which is a process for some it's seeing a psychologist for some it's having some uh, antidepressants to help take the edge off so that you can do something else for others it's talking to somebody uh, really close to them I'd say what we really need to be doing is not waiting until we're in the depths of despair to do something about our mental health so my advice would be that we're putting proactive strategies in place all of the time and realizing how important it is to do that so I specialize in positive psychology for a reason and that's because you know I love this stuff and obviously it's my work but I build my life around it and I I I don't know whether I would have survived through some things in my life if I didn't have some of those tools and some of the people in my life I have to give gratitude to them as well and I think that that's what's really important so seeing that mental health spectrum again if we're starting to notice signs that we are dipping so maybe going beyond the halfway mark of just oh I'm okay I'm not great but I'm not awful either or if those people around us are noticing that we're dipping because the, the question about what can people do for you is people who know you very well can be really honest with you and say okay I'm noticing that you're you're dipping below five you know we wouldn't say it like that but I'm just talking about the spectrum the scale and I think that's a really nice thing to keep in mind and then once we're in that space where we're a four or a three before we get down to a two and a one and a flat out zero we can start putting some practices in place and, and that you know individual individual to everybody obviously as to what helps people to feel better but I think we need to be proactive rather than okay what do we do when we're depressed because actually when you're depressed there are a few things that will help but it's so much harder because you're already in that pit and you need to pull right out of it but when we're just if we can just start to recognize and check in with ourselves and notice ourselves in terms of our mental health at any given time every day check in with yourself then we start to realize when we're needing that so every day not without fail because I'm you know I'm no I try to be a guru at this stuff but I'm by no means perfect at this but I mean you're most, human I'm human exactly thank you but um most days I ask myself how am I and what do I need and sometimes like I'm okay and I'm not sure what I need I think I'm okay and sometimes it's okay I get this yeah no I'm not good what is it what do I need I need to stop or I need to call somebody or actually I need to go and uh, go outside or whatever it might be it doesn't have to be huge but by checking in with yourself every day you can then notice when you're dipping down to four or three and then when you need to put some of those practices in place and I just think other people we need to talk and other people need to be honest with us so there's an ask twice campaign which I really really love and that's about you know how we all say especially the Brits how how are you doing yeah fine thanks and then we leave it at that because that's the standard response what we need to do is if those people who are a bit concerned about somebody they know or love ask twice so say how are you doing and you'll get the fine thanks and say are you sure you're okay because I've got some time to chat if you want to or are you sure you're doing all right because I've noticed that you know you haven't been out so much lately or whatever it might be and then what that does, it gives that person that, oh, okay, you really do have the time, you really are interested, and I, I can safely talk to you about how I'm doing. Can I agree completely so, about the red flags? Sorry, Greg. I just want to, I, I, I want to highlight for, for people that might be watching this, hopefully someone watches it, <laughs> the two things that, that she, what Vicky's mentioned there is self-awareness, and a support network and it's just so crucial because the self-awareness piece is massive being able to understand how you feel is so important and that as a bloke has been a very difficult journey to get to because at no point in my life until this moment did I know what it felt like to grieve properly you know i lost grandparents and stuff but like i mean a real tangible grief or that real anxiety or whatever so actually being able to articulate how i was feeling was a very difficult process and if i'd just been educated on knowing what i was feeling that is called this it's not going to change how i'm feeling but then i can start getting some strategies around it. So self-awareness, massive. And the other one, that support network, is gold dust. Because people around you that can say, mate, 
notice you're on the piss again, everything all right. And that's your opportunity, whether you do something or not. But those, again, going back to those that are, have got this, this, this kind of job of supporting people, is that's, that's, that's how people get support, is by p other people around them will say, I noticed everything's not okay. And that's often what will spark them to go and see Vicky or whoever, because everybody else is noticing that something's up with them. Because life just happens to most of us, and we don't really ever take the time to check in with exactly how we're feeling and what's going on so your own self-awareness but other people's awareness of you is literally it yeah. to summarize to repeat everything vicky said and pretend it's my idea she's good she's good she's not going anywhere um, i'll edit it out of this won't i <laughs> yeah what, who said that um and, and the thing is that if there's no education so greg i don't realize i don't think you realize how great it is you coming out and talking about mental health and everything else because the, the bit for me was the fear and the panic of what this thing was that was coming in from the side now if you've been educated on something you don't necessarily have that fear and the panic because you've been able to talk about it within and seeing it with other people so i think there's an education piece and there's that um inner critic the way you talk to yourself is a red flag for me personally like what i always say would you talk to a five-year-old um the same as you would talk to yourself would you encourage them and bring them up? Or would you say, no, you're a fool, get out there, you're rubbish and everything else. And I think once you identify whether you're talking to yourself like you would a child or whether you're talking to yourself as, a, uh, as, as aggressively, that is a huge red flag for me. Look, I know you both have, have got to go. It, it, you're massively busy and in demand, so I can't thank you enough. Um, if I could come to you both now, I just want to thank you both for sharing stories and including this. I think this will be one of many. I'd love to do this again. Um, and Greg and Vicky, if I could ask you, now knowing what you do about everything else, what is your definition of well-being um, and how do you ensure that you stay away from those red flags? Well-being is, uh, is not a constant state. It's relative to what life is, right? So well-being isn't, I always feel like this well-being is the ability to flex and change to what life throws at you and it's through the strategies that we've talked about um with vicky that i think the people get there thanks greg <laughs> i i think that's perfect actually greg i don't think i could do much more than that and um, all i can say is that for me personally you know there are definitions of well-being about you know being a part of the community and um living a fulfilled life and feeling like you're functioning every day and all the things you need to do and and that's all great as, as in terms of defining it but for me it's really just feeling okay like feeling calm and like I'm doing all right actually and it's really subjective I think what well-being is but if I've got the absence of turmoil or the absence of stress I mean that's great but I'm not sure whether that's quite well-being but if I'm feeling actually yeah i'm all right i'm doing okay um all things considered as you say it's it's fluid then um yeah obviously i want these moments of happiness and that's partly what i focus on in my work but you can't stay elevated all of the time so it doesn't mean you're not well if people can have mental health diagnoses and have good mental well-being which we'll come on to another time because i know that sounds like a paradox but you can be mentally well with a with a diagnosis and a condition it's just about your acceptance and kind of your living alongside it really yeah it's about feeling good enough sometimes as well isn't it um look, thank you ever so much is there anything else that you two would like to add please come back again is there anything you'd like to add now and please tell everyone where they can find you uh linkedin is probably the best place or instagram greg bateman nothing else to add vicky covered it all <laughs> It's been great to meet you, Greg, and see you again, Simon. And, and yeah, I've got uh, LinkedIn as well and Instagram and Twitter. It's Dr. Vicky Barnes across the board to keep it easy for me, really. And I have a website now, which is drvickybarnes.com. So it'd be great to see people there. Okay, well, we'll, we'll all go back to our busy lives and our busy schedules and calendars. Nothing stops, does there? Um, but for, for that last hour, it's been an absolute privilege to be in your company and just to open the conversation. Wellity is here to normalise the conversation around mental health, um, to encourage everyone to be the best version of themselves. Um, and I can't thank you both enough for, 
for joining in. I do hope this is the first of many. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.